Hello, welcome and thank you for being with us today. My name is Stephanie LaRue. I am the Associate Director at CSREA, the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. CSREA is an interdisciplinary hub that aims to build community with the public and among scholars and students working on race and ethnicity in and around the United States. We invite you to learn more about us and our program offerings on our website, www.brown.edu slash race. Today's event entitled Kevin Kwashi, Black Aliveness or a Poetics of Being is a book talk by professor of English at Brown University, Dr. Kevin Kwashi. This is the first of a four part new book talk series this semester, which highlights new and notable works that help us to better understand how we study, research and engage with questions of race, ethnicity and indigeneity. Our host this afternoon is Dr. Trisha Rose, Chancellor Professor of Africana Studies at Brown. At this time, I invite uh, Dr. Rose to introduce our guest. Thank you. Great, thank you, Stephanie. I really appreciate that. Um, welcome everyone. We're really delighted that you're here joining us uh, at this inaugural new book talk in a series. Um, we are super delighted to have Professor Kwashi with us to talk about his latest book, which is amazing. Um, we are also um, wanting to just give you a little bit of structure and information about our plans here today. Um, we will uh, begin with a presentation by Professor Kwashi, and that will be followed by some discussion um, that will take place in the Q&A um, function of this Zoom. Uh, and I'll moderate that conversation as well as uh, talk with my dear colleague uh, as part of the discussion to follow. Um, let me just briefly read his bio uh, and I will turn it over to Professor Kwashi thereafter. Professor Kwashi is in the Department of English at Brown University and teaches Black cultural and literary studies. He's the author or editor of four books, most recently Black Aliveness or A Poetics of Being, and The Sovereignty of Quiet, Beyond Resistance in Black Culture, and a number of other works on Black feminist, Black womanist studies, which have been long central to Kwashi's thinking about Blackness. He also writes and teaches on Black queer studies and on aesthetics. What he doesn't say here is that he's also an incredible colleague and thinker, co a co-collaborator of thought, and an amazing teacher. So we are thrilled to have him here at Brown and to count him among CSREA's community. Thank you so much for coming. And I now invite Dr. Kwashi to share his presentation. Thank you so much, Stephanie Leroux and Trisha Rose um, and to the folks at CSREA. Um, I'll say something at the end as an extension of my gratitude, but let me just start with that generic. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for engaging me. Thanks to folks who are here also. I hope you're all well and safe. I wanna tell you six things about this work on Black aliveness and then read from the end. I'll say that part of why I've organized it this way is not only because I'm an introverted Virgo, but also because of a kind of unease that I have about discursive engagement of work that sometimes happens um, in these spaces. And so I want to try to be as clear and as generous to the folks who are here as possible and also to maybe calm my own nerves. So to start, I'm interested in a notion of aliveness, not black life, since there's nothing to be said about life, since life is too complicated to withstand the syntax of saying, but instead an idea or a conceit or a practice or an invocation or an evocation or an inspiration or, or overture of aliveness that is manifest in black art particularly black literature. Though to behold this aliveness requires that we orient ourselves differently to how we read and how we think about the dynamics of reading black literature. In thinking about aliveness, I'm trying to articulate another register for black thought beyond or next to the discourses of black death. Death that is real and always, discourses that are theoretical and provocative. I'm trying to ignite another inflection of black thought beyond the terms that such notions of death make for how we think about blackness, 
the idea of non-being, for example, that is conceptually essential in an anti-Black world, the objection and antagonism of Black pessimism's useful framing of things. These are irrefutable, yes, and they are not total or singular. Said another way, moved as I am by the very instance of my aliveness and that of people around me, I want to think as if through the sheerness of that aliveness, not a life already overdetermined by death terms, but a life that holds it all. But I'm making a mistake this early in the talk, since I don't want to talk about life, but aliveness, a quality, a notion, an aesthetic. I start then with the idea of imagine a Black world. I do this as a sly attempt to bypass the heft of the urgency, even the insurgency of an anti-Black social world, as if to say that to read a Black text is to be able to imagine a Black world, to try to stay suspended in a Black world, as I write in the book. In a Black world, in whatever manifestations of Black worldness texts create, Blackness, not anti-Blackness, is totality. In such a world, Black being is capacious and right, not more right than, just right as is, life as is. I believe that the worldness of Black texts, if one reads with such a temperament, makes it possible to withstand Black being as human being, to behold Blackness as one's ethical reckoning with being alive. So for me, the phrase, imagine a Black world, is the offer that Black literature makes to the reader. And I mean the Black reader particularly, uh, a kind of orienting and reorienting of the Black reader as subject and object in relation to the work, which is the world of the work. Let me explain a little bit what I mean, since I think I'm, I'm leaving some things out here. In some ways, I'm making a claim about how we read and about reading as work, that reading is a certain kind of labor. I think often of a moment, um, the late Toni Morrison was visiting with Oprah Winfrey. It might have been on the occasion when Winfrey had selected Song of Solomon as the as the book club. It was the first such selection of Morrison's that Winfrey had made. And uh, at, at a dinner, Winfrey makes this statement of saying that when she reads Morrison's work, that she finds herself having to go over it again and being confused and having to struggle and it takes lots of time and effort. And Morrison, who was so characteristically um, efficient and intelligent and maybe even slightly shady, just paused looked at her and said, my dear, that is called reading. What I love about that, aside from it, the little bit of shade that might be there, is that there also is a larger discourse of how we casually and simplistically read Black literature via a racist framework that presumes either that we know what Black literature is about, it's about resistance or racism, and whom it speaks to, it speaks to white people, and what it's supposed to do, it's supposed to transform the moral landscape or move white readers to understand their culpability in racism. It might even be to inspire the black audience in a collective and surface way. So the provocation of Imagine a Black World for me is an attempt to try to open up how we think about audience and textual belonging. Since in the terrible logic of a US imaginary, White people either get to have full, full possession of every cultural thing or get to be needily anxious about how to engage the thing properly. And conversely, notice I'm using a binary logic here. Conversely, black people are either dispossessed from their cultural things or simplistically are conflated as those things. This equation is a racist essentialism that disregards artist, art, reader, human. It is a lazy orientation to reading and a lazy orientation to reading, I think, is sinful because it demeans materiality and vibrancy and vagary. It dismisses art as phenomenal as well as phenomenological inhabitants. 
Therefore, I'm interested in the quality of aliveness notable in the world-making aesthetics of poems and essays, in how those poems and essays can be read for what they tell us about our being, about how we are and how we can be. I'm interested both in the ways that the world of Black text constitutes our rightness of being, as I am also interested in the ethical implications of such constituting. And I should pause just to say very quickly, when I use the, the pronoun our, I do specifically in this instance mean the Black reader, simply because I'm trying to do a reading that undermines the kind of larger discourse of reading that I've set up. But I would never imply, because indeed it would be absurd to say so, that the Black text only belongs to a Black reader or even only imagines a Black reader. I'm trying to enact um, an instance of one reading so, so as to pursue a line of thought. And I'd be happy to talk um, more about that if people want. So let me try to give you a quick glimpse of some of what I try to do in the book, though admittedly it, it is a glimpse. And here I was going to say a longer thing, but I cut it for the sake of time. So I'm gonna read what I've written um, because I think maybe it captures some of the idea. Embedded in this work are some questions about my anxiety of seeming naive, as if in engaging aliveness in the midst of such a state of ruin and terrible that I'm being naive. And I don't just mean the ruin and terrible of this year or the past four years, or the last 12, or the last 39, or the last 150. There is something to be said about the way that an assumption that the political or even the historical conceptualization of urgency, the way that political and historical time seems to surpass the utility of how the literary conceptualizes time. That is, in the midst of ruin, what we want and need most is to be able to reckon with the political and social urgency of things, and even the historical urgency of things, and there are ways in which maybe the literary seems a little bit inept, and I'm trying to make an argument for the literary. I know that in saying that, I'm making a very surface comment about disciplines and disciplinarity. And indeed, people in political theory, in history, in other disciplines, including iconic writers like Michel Foucault, Achille Membe, Jane Bennett, Zaidia Hartman, Bonnie Honig, right? That there are lots of people who can test the kind of disciplinary rigidity that I'm suggesting exists in the way in which we confront the world now. So I don't want to misrepresent disciplinary nuance. What I want to say is simply this, that the urgency that lives in the world now for any of us who care about justice, and particularly for those of us who are Black, that urgency is real. And there is also an urgency that lives in the encounter one has with a literary text. We might call it literary time. And the, the urgency of literary time is no less relevant than that of the political or the social world. The scholar Daphne Lamas is doing brilliant work right now thinking about Black aesthetic time. And since she is one of my best thought partners, I lean into her ideas and conversations with her just to acknowledge that I am deliberately insisting on aesthetics an insistence that aesthetics can match or parallel or support and maybe even surpass the insistence that one feels in the political and the social. And the reason that I'm insisting on aesthetics will make, I think, more sense when I talk about the ethical and the ethical in about 15 minutes. So bear with me. This poem. Some of you here will certainly have heard me talk about this poem, but as the poet Nikki Finney says, repetition is holy. This is an untitled poem by Lucille Clifton. Um, it goes by the name Reply, which is the first full um, line um, of verse by Clifton. It includes a paratext. The paratext has some harshness in it. Um, so the poem is composed of two parts. Um, I'm, I'm showing you the entire thing 
on the screen the way the poem exists, but I'm gonna to go to two slides that separate the two so, the, so I can place emphasis on the poem itself the way I want to. But this is reply. From a letter written to Dr. W. B. Du Bois by Alvin Borquez of Clark University in Massachusetts on April 3rd, 1905. Quote, we are pursuing an investigation here on the subject of crying as an expression of the emotions and should like very much to learn about its peculiarities among the colored people. We have been referred to you as a person competent to give us information on the subject. We desire especially to know about the following salient aspects. One, whether the Negro sheds tears. Reply, he do, she do. They live, they love, they try, they tire, they flee, they fight, they bleed, they break, they moan, they mourn, they weep, they die, they do, they do, they do. This poem. Notice first the dancing waltz of the anaphora as if this is a drum beat or a heartbeat of paired stressed syllables. She do, he do, they live, they love. How this sequence creates a deliberate formation in what might otherwise look like a random gathering of actions such that live precedes and parallels love, moan yields to mourn. The alliteration guides our recognition of the connection between the poem's verbs, just as the assonance, those rich deep vowels, threads together flee, bleed, and weep, or try and die, or the extended pleasure of the long you in do, 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 especially in closing, which looks then like the ellipses of an energy that's moving towards an inexpressible infinity, as in dot, dot, dot. Notice too how the poem speaker directs us where to look and assumes that we can and will know how to look rightly. That is, pay attention to how the poem negotiates the politics of looking via its pronouns by casting the speaker arrive from and as observant of Black collectivity. Beautifully, Clifton uses the objectification of the third person to relish in distance and plurality. He, she, they, those people. Even the singular pronouns via vernacular phrasing are sutured to a kind of plural action. He, do, she, do. This syntax, I think, invites the reader to behold the other. And in this way, the poem refuses the specular as a site of black objection. Rather, it instantiates looking as a shared relationality, especially since the looking is something that the reader does in concert with the speaker's prudent guidance, as in, look at this, the speaker says, or now look at that, look at that. Clifton's use of third person plural positions the speaker as an observer, a chronicler, and reorients the practice of looking beyond its destructive intent to secure racial difference, to enact racial harm. Clifton uses the distance of they to encase the scene in a world of its own. And the poem scene is a black world full of the blackness of the presenting one and the ones being presented. Masterfully, the speaker stands almost like an MC or a host who seems to revel in what it is to look at all of this quotidian magnificence rendered via the expansive line of words ambling down the page, staircase or a waterfall or a slideshow of being after being after being linked in that beautiful two beat music and gesturing toward what cannot be fully said since after all, it is not possible to present every instance of black being in a pantheon or to map it in the sky or to track it all over the edge of earth. 
being looked at is a kind of horror for us. And so I love that this poem marshals looking as a constitutive act of Black being. I can't overstate to you how crucial I think it is that the speaker doesn't say we, as in we live, we love, since that pronoun would cement the poem stance as being against the hateful question, as a Black voice speaking to resist the harmful overtures of white violation. Clifton speaker witnesses so the reply is not towards white violence, but instead recognizes the capaciousness of being. Here, the speaker stands not on a side, as if on the side of Black people, but in the midst of the whole world of Black being. A racist happening prefaces the poem, surely, and racist happenings surely linger in every indicative verb in this verse. But in a Black world, the racist thing is not the beginning or the end of being. And what matters is not only what is done to the subject, but also how the subject is. Anti-Blackness is a part of Blackness, but not all of how or what Blackness is. Anti-Blackness may be total in the world, but it is not total in the Black world. The logics of this poem then astonishes me still every time the way the aesthetics here work to constitute aliveness astonishes me. So I use this poem to set up the idea that Black text can enact a kind of aesthetic world making. And then I try to move into thinking about the idea of aliveness. And I set for myself a goal today of ridiculously trying to offer you a glimpse of everything that happens in the book. And I'm gonna see if I can make it happen. Bear with me. Thank you for being here. Aliveness. Can I say again, how alive your being alive makes me feel. The literary series Barbara Christian wrote this sweet bit to poet Audre Lorde after Lorde's presentation at the 1978 MLA convention. And everything that I might pursue about a concept of aliveness is legible in this sweetness. Can I say again how alive your being alive makes me feel? So for me, here in this declaration, aliveness is constituted in repetition and therefore it's unfurling. It's an experience one encounters rather than possesses a relational capacity manifested through the speaking one's sensibilities, through her feeling, through her intelligence. Here too is the ordinary quality of aliveness, its inherence, the language it's, uh, that expresses it is common, but so too is the feeling, as well as the kind of exclamation of force and openness that is exemplified by the question mark and the exclamation point. And finally, here in this quotation is a message about and sent to another that casts attention on the messenger. That is, if we're reading Christian's missive conceptually, which I'm trying to do, I'm trying to use it at the beginning to set up an idea of aliveness, we will notice how the messenger is being suspended in a scene of tingling astuteness. Can I say again? how alive your being alive makes me feel. This suspended shimmering is her being in the world, which is also an orientation to being. So very quickly, I would just say it was important for me because I didn't want to talk about life in the book. Um, and I didn't want to give over discussions of aliveness to think about biopolitics or the, the differentiation between animate and inanimate. I really wanted to try to think about aliveness as a force of things, to borrow from Jane Bennett's language, as inherence, as a force of and in being. And to do that, I turn to Audre Lorde, the opening of her 1977 masterwork, Poetry is Not a Luxury. This is how the essay begins. The quality of light by which we scrutinize our lives has direct bearing upon the product which we live and upon the changes which we hope to bring about through those lives. It is within this light that we form those ideas by which we pursue 
our magic and make it realized. This is poetry as illumination. For it is through poetry that we give name to those ideas which are, until the poem, nameless and formless, about to be birthed, but already felt. That distillation of experience from which true poetry springs, birth thought as dream births concept, as feeling births idea, as knowledge births and precedes understanding. Look again at that first sentence, the quality of light by which we scrutinize our lives has direct bearing upon the product which we live and upon the changes which we hope to bring about through those lives. Incisively, Lord declares that the manner and sensation of how we pay attention to our being constitute our being itself. The manner and the sensation of how we pay attention to our being constitute our being itself as well as informs what our being is and becomes in the world. From the outset in that gorgeous first sentence, Lord theorizes being as embodied and experiential and reflective and aspirational. She describes feeling and sensation as kin to thought and reason all in one sentence. There's a snarky thing one might want to say about the body of work that Immanuel Kant produced to navigate ambivalence through some of these same ideas that Audre Lorde achieves in one sentence, but there will be no snarkiness today, other than Toni Morrison's snarkiness earlier. Um, said another way, her claim links reason, the word scrutinize, to other capacities of knowing, especially habits of the body. And it is important here that imagination does not precede experience. Instead, the engagement of experience, what she calls distillation, constitutes imaginative potentiality. Also want to be clear that Lord does not separate the body from, uh, the, does not distinguish the body as an apparatus of thought. Lord advances an idiom where the metaphysical isn't before or separate from the physical and where the physical is not figured only via the body in its contemporary time. There is no body mind split here. And I'm going to skip part of the next slide to simply say that, um, that Lord, what I, what I especially like is that Lord understands thinking as what a body does with experience. So often when we're thinking through work by people gendered female and or thinking through work by people who are racially marked as non-white, that we, we want the, the idea of the body to do something that is separate and different from say thought, from reason. Um, I think Lord is advancing something that's a little bit more um, nuanced and complicated because indeed it is problematic to presume that reason or facility of reason or thought doesn't also cohere in the human practice of people and indeed the, the um, people that Lord is imagining. Okay, um, just very quickly, uh, I, I take this idea of al aliveness from Lord and try to conceptualize it as a poetic and especially as a relational capacity by thinking with Martin Buber and um, Edouard Glaçant. But in the interest of trying to, to get, the, I want to read from the conclusion. So I want to try and move through two more things about the work. Oh, this is, this, this, this part I, I really, um, I decided late in preparation for this that I would do this. I'm really glad that I'm doing this. Um, I'm always trying to articulate an idea of Black oneness. And to get there this time, I call on Black women's literature and moments of audacious declarations of being. So there is in, in, in Black women's literature, certainly in the last, in Black women's literature over the last 50 years or so, there are these iconic declarations of um, audaciousness, uh, audacious declarations of the speaker in the work um, pronouncing themselves as, as singular and ex exemption, ex exceptional and therefore a kind of exemption. Let me give you some examples. 
I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? That's from Lucille Clifton's Won't You Celebrate With Me. All the women are white, all the blacks are men, but some of us are brave, which is the title of the iconic Black Feminist um, Studies book. I am who the world and I have never seen before. I am who the world and I have, who have never seen before. Audre Lorde's from the Cancer Journals. Many of you know Sojourner Truth's iconic um, uh, speech where she, through first person singularity, um, she testifies um, to her own presence, her own being, um, and it's recorded through the misattributed refrain, aren't I a woman? Anna Julia Cooper, who in 1986 announces that only the black woman can say when and where I enter, then and there, the whole Negro race enters with me. Horton Spiller's 1987 essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, begins, let's face it, I'm a marked woman, but not everybody knows my name. My country needs me, and if I were not here, I would have to be invented. True Day Harris, maybe this reference is one many people might not know from her, icon, her uh, important book, um, From Mammies to Militant. I think the book opens this way, called Matriarch, Emasculator, and Hot Mama, Sometimes Sister, Pretty Baby, Auntie, Mammy, and Girl, called Unwed Mother, Welfare Recipient, and Inner City Consumer. The Black American woman has had to admit that while nobody knew the trouble she saw, everybody, his brother and his dog, felt qualified to explain her, even to herself. June Jordan, we are the ones we have been waiting for, the poem for South African women. And Tazaki Shange's beautiful choral moment in For Colored Girls, I found God in myself and I loved her. I loved her fiercely. Alice Walker's definition of womanism, third definition with ends with loves herself regardless. And that period before the regardless, which makes that regardless do a certain kind of work. Nikki Giovanni's abiding ego tripping, which begins, I was born in the Congo. I walked the Fertile Crescent and built the Sphinx and ends, I am so perfect, so divine, so ethereal, so surreal, I cannot be comprehended except by my permission. I read these statements as not through the bankrupt notion of the individual. To be clear, individualism is a bankrupt idea and it is not at all compatible with Black life in an anti-Black world. And because, of course, aliveness is relational, it's therefore not individual. So I don't read them as instances of individuality. I read them as instances of first person being used to try to sustain a concept of oneness, of one's right to be a one. Corten Spillers says dramatically that the concept of a one is a concept that goes missing in Black cultural thought. One the personal, impersonal pronoun, being both subject and object, the syntax through which a person might philosophize or conceptualize an idea. That fictional case of one, it is imaginary and fictional because it works probably via abstraction, as if you get to abstract yourself into being. Let me quote two moments from my thinking that might help um, efficiently to conceptualize what I'm suggesting here. The first is one, the proper impersonal pronoun that casts its speaker, not as an individual secured against other individuals, but as a figure of being, as a projection for conceptualizing being. The second is the idea of thinking of oneness as a practice of knowing that could be described as I am knowing as I am knowing. In this compounded phrase, the first clause, I am knowing, establishes certainty, and the second revels in disillusion. 
the ethos here is a fidelity to what one knows so as to deepen and then surpass that knowing. I am knowing as I am knowing. I'm trying to suggest that in aliveness, the black one is a one, is a kind of poem or poesis, that is a being who is brought and who is bringing oneself into being. A black female subject as a one, isn't that something? Over the 25 years of spending time reading through and thinking with black literature, particularly with black women's writing, I have found this, this insistence to be compelling. And now I found it to be especially, especially philosophically useful for thinking about an idea of oneness. Oneness, to be able to project one's being as the case or example through which one imagines how to be more, how to be better, how to be otherwise, how to be in the next moment from now. Ethics. Therefore, part of why I set up the idea of a Black world in the beginning and the idea of a Black reader as the idealized reader, reader in this work is because I want to get to the ethical. I want to make a claim about oneness because I want to make a claim about the ethical. And the claim is this, that there is an ethical confrontation to be had for a Black reader in a Black text. In an anti-Black world, the Black subject is essentially non-relational. In an anti-Black world, there's no ethical possibility for the one who's Black. There's no figuring through one's humanity because one humanity, one's humanity is figured already as marginal, subjected, diminished. Said another way, if the ethical conceptually depends on one's instantiation as a one, the discourse of anti-Blackness hinders such instantiation. And in the project, I start with that incredible moment in a Time Magazine interview where Toni Morrison says of Setha, um, the protagonist in her um, 1986 novel, Beloved, Morrison says of Setha's act of infanticide, um, she says, it was the right thing to do and she had no right to do it. And I play off of that incredible chiasmus. Uh, I wish I had just decided today to talk alone about that chapter and that scene. And Morrison's realization of two kinds of rights functioning there in, in Setha's doing. And the way um, Morrison demands of Setha, regardless of Setha's positionality in a world as an enslaved woman or as a fugitive woman, Morrison insists that there's also an ethical figuring that Setha is doing, as well as an ethical figuring that exists in the, in the context of what Setha has done, which I think is an incredible, um, incredible offering that Morrison makes to us. An anti-Black imaginary presumes to have nullified the question how to be, since we are either whatever the world says we are, or we are enmeshed in refusing that imposition. Of course, acquiescence is intolerable. And though defiance is essential, it is not sufficient to honor ethical inhabiting. In either instance, the black one is turned away from rather than turned into herself alienated from the site that might gener generate ethical rendering. And the presumption here, right, is that the ethical always begins with the one and a sense of oneness always begins with the capacity of a human trying to imagine and conceptualize what they are feeling, where they are, and what they might, um, what they might engage or manifest in the moment in, of, of the world that they are in. I want to be careful. I'm not talking about individualism and I'm not talking about a kind of um, solipsistic self-centeredness. I'm talking about a, a, a meditative and philosophical positionality that always opens up then to being in the world because it is relational and being in the world demands being of the capacity to encounter the world that you're in. I think with Morrison and Baldwin through this, and I'm just going to read, um, I couldn't figure out an efficient way to engage this. So I'm just going to read this, say three quick things, 
and then read a little bit from the end so we can have some time for conversation. One can only undertake the ethical in a context where orientation remains open, such as the relationality constituted in a text invocation of a black world. That is, as a question, how am I being, how am I becoming? That question cannot be figured through the terms of worth and value on which anti-blackness is predicated. Simply, every black one is already worthy since they're here on earth and worth is a human legacy. And embedded in this claim is the companion notion that every human being is called on to manifest their worth, to believe it, to act of its accord, to negotiate its parameters and fall short of its obligation over and again. This is what we might call grace, the work of trying every day to be engaged in an investigation of one's being. I know that the historical denigration of blackness troubles any suggestion of the, uh, the suggestion that one has to reckon with or earn one's worth. That is, I know that that might sound as if somehow um, I, I am confirming or speaking with a kind of discourse that presumes that black self-worth doesn't already exist. That's not what I mean. I mean simply the, the human imperative that I presume to be there and that I read some of these readers um, to say is there. And still, these readers seem to say, the invitation to reckon with one's worth must be countenance without being anchored to an ideology of black non-value. Baby, you just gotta reckon. Reckon we must, since the reckoning with being human is ours to be, bear. Our humanity is our burden. James Baldwin reminds us. We need not battle for it. We need only do what is infinitely more difficult. That is, accept it. One doesn't have to display one's reckoning to another so as to have it verified or confirmed. One doesn't have to be of a certain manner of reckoning or tethered to a normative idea of what constitutes ethical encounter. I'm not talking about an easy notion of respectability. I'm talking about going there and trying to meet yourself and to meet that weighty question. So in the interest of time, I will say that um, I, part of the claim I'm trying to make is that the permissiveness of a black world, which is the world that a black text offers, allows the engagement with that kind of um, ethicality. Um, and so I think a little bit about the idea of studying, um, not so much in the way that Fred Moten and, and Stefano Harney conceptualizes studying. Um, but I think about this, this practice of ethical engagement as a kind of studying. I, I try to recall the idea of work and maybe to redeem the notion of work from its, um, its limited conceptualization in, in, in like a capitalist logic. And to think back to the, to the general idea of a body doing a thing as work. Um, and also talk a little bit about loneliness all through reading some examples from um, Toni Morrison, Sula, some work by James Baldwin and some uh, poems by Ross Gay, Lucille Clifton and Tracy K. Smith. Um, what else do I want to say quickly before I get to the end? Um, I'm going to skip this. It comes back to oneness and philosophy. I think I've suggested a lot of that. Oh, most crucially for me, the, the offering I think I'm trying to make is a sense of where do we look to behold ourselves in our becoming? And I take um, the stance that in some ways, black literature can be a place uh, and, and a praxis and an, an invitation for one's looking to behold oneself and one's becoming, not for easy confirmation of the rightness of one being, one's being, but for the possibility of a riskful venture that one can use and have in regards to reading, in regards to reading in the time and space and the urgency and intensity of the aesthetic. Before I end and read from the conclusion, I wanna say something that's mundane, which is to say, it's been a year and then some. I wanna to say too, that um, Trisha Rose and Stephanie LaRue, 
do institutionalities superbly and humanly. And I say this because when I first arrived at Brown, um, they both invited me to give a what I'm thinking about now lunch talk. And I essentially presented a messy version of something that's excerpted in chapter five, the, the thing about ethics. And it was both the casual and yet serious engagement that I got in that, in that invitation, both from them, but also from the people who were there that helped me to become clearer about this aspect of the work, this thinking about ethics, which for me might be the heart of the work. I took their invitation seriously and I was taken seriously not only by them, but by the company of, the, of people whom they had invited into that space. And here I especially want to note Andre C. Willis, who's a professor in the Department of Religion, who in that lunchtime talk asked me a gentle, generous, beautiful question that sent me right back to my office and that straightened the chapter out. So I think of it as a gift that in an, ac in ac in an academic space, we know the academy can be brutal. We know the academy is not always about studying. Um, that indeed I, I have found CSREA to be a space where I can study and I'm grateful for that. Let me then read from the end. This is a book by one Black person about reading and about Blackness. It is also a love letter to myself made as if in a Black world where the capacities of being can be taken for granted. Indeed, imagine a Black world is a love gesture that says to the one, be as you are, you will become and you will undo. As you are, you are and you are worthy. Inhabit that unfurl in it and into the world. In this way, the invitation to imagine a Black world requires enduring work. It is a call to relation. That means it is a call to suspend in the heft of the work, an invocation of ethicality that resides in the capaciousness of one's figuring through one's oneness, discerning every day how to be in the world. I am what the world and I have never seen before, Audre Lorde writes of herself in the Cancer Journals. That ecstatic statement of newness and determination and surprise and rightness, a statement of the right to be becoming. Such a statement might be misread as individuality, but it is not that. It is relational. Black aliveness is the whole world of being. Again, individualism is a, bank, is a bankrupt idea. It is incompatible with Black life in an anti-Black world. Aliveness is or as being like a poem, and I try to make that case in the book. For as long as I can remember, I've seen the world in and through Black women's understanding of Blackness. In my study, to be in relation to Black femaleness is to be in relation to Blackness, which is also what it means to be in relation to Black aliveness. This Black femaleness that I study with is ecumenical, a word which in its root means the whole inhabited world. These works, these works tell us that aliveness is personal, not individual. Personal as a term of reckoning with the condition of being on earth, of being alive, and therefore responsible to both things. We have in us aliveness. We are of this aliveness. And indeed, our aliveness can help us navigate being in the world and being alive in the world, including the ethical question, how to be, which is so often troubled by anti-Blackness. Aliveness is a repertoire for having an ethical orientation in a world that is not ethically oriented. This is the last bit. We are not the idea of us. We are not even the idea that we hold of us. We are just us, multiple and varied, becoming the heterogeneity of us. Blackness in a Black world is everything, which means it gets to be freed from being any one thing. We are ordinary beauty, 
view black people and beauty must be allowed to do its beautiful ordinary work. We don't live in a black world, this is true. But the as if of such imagining that literature offers, the as if can inspire how we might navigate the world that we indeed live in, the one that is anti-black and that resists and resents and despises our being. We don't live in a black world, but in a poem, in an essay, in a poem, there's an orientation of such being waiting for us. And so in some ways I offer these poems in our hands as a world of an invitation to how to try to be. That's Black Aliveness. I'll stop there. Wow. Whew. I feel like I was in a, an incredibly intense intellectual meditation session. Mm. And I'm not sure if I should go take a nap or ask you a question because you know that's what me good meditation does for me. It's so peace inducing. Um, I hope everyone who is sort of present uh, with us here, um, wow, there's a bunch of questions already. Um, I, I have my own, but there are literally four or five really complex questions. Uh, Kevin, that was really remarkable. Um, Thank you. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and um, I, I guess um, this isn't a question, I'll say this is a statement as people's questions move into the open section in the Q&A. Um, you know, there's something about the, the tension you create constantly between um, the, the, the concept of, of this creation of this space and the drive to imagine ourselves as needing to resist in order mm -hmm. to create that space that you're so, ref, you know, refusing really, mm -hmm. I think in a super important way. And I'm sure people will come to this, but uh, it's, um, I, you, it's clear you need to repeat that to us because I think there's something about what we think we know about mm -hmm how to survive, right? That, mm. um, that, that your framework kind of flies in the face of, right? It really mm. requires something else. But I'm, I'm gonna just leave that out there for a moment um, and, uh, and turn to some of these amazing, much more developed questions. That was really um, more of a feeling question. Um, our first uh, question is from Elizabeth S who I don't know who, what the S is for, but that's what we know. Um, greetings, Dr. Kwashi. Thank you for this presentation, indeed, and your new book. Your writing is beautiful. That is absolutely true. This is my editorializing on the question. Uh, I have appreciated your work since your marvelous offering of the sovereignty of quiet. Today, you touched upon the idea of reading as labor. May you share how you read within the laboring and how you decide what to read. Hmm. Will you read the last part? Do you mind yeah. saying the last part of that yeah. question again? Today, you touched upon the idea of reading as labor. Hmm. May you share how you read within the laboring and how you decide what to read. Hmm. Um. Well, um, first of all, uh, Trisha, thank you for the kindness um, that you said after the talk and to the person who wrote this question. Thank you for, again, for, you know, I, I don't take it for granted that my studying will manifest anything um, because I'm just studying. And so maybe one way I'll approach the question, uh, and if I miss the mark, I'm, I'm happy for the person to write in and ask differently. Um, I think about the instance of sitting with a, a, a line in a Gwendolyn Brooks poem and trying to figure out what I understand that line to be. And I think about how that requires of me a kind of presence in the moment of being with that line to say nothing of a maybe a, a, a presence in regard to the fullness of effort that, that I can imagine that Gwendolyn Brooks gave to constructing, you know, sitting day after day and whittling poem after poem. And I think that's part of the, the scene of the labor, including 
like it might take me an hour to sit and be with that line and trying to figure out do I have the luxury of doing that and then also trying to fig figure out well what does it mean to not have the luxury of doing that and the reason I say it this way is because that's part of what I'm gesturing to in terms of the urgency that the literary can offer mm -hmm. because I think that urgency that that hotness or frustration of of not being able to understand something or thinking I've got it that I think there's something in that that could be useful to understanding the hotness and the confusion of the political or the social or just being in the world. Mm -hmm. But I think often there's a way in which the labor of the literary, not just my labor of reading, but the labor of the person who made the text. And of course, we could do other kinds of readings of labor as it, as it re regards the materiality of the text. I don't, I don't think we attend to that as work. And part of it, again, might be the way in which work is corrupted as a, as a notion. Um, and part of it is just the intensity and the urgency of the scene we're in. So it seems a little frivolous to think, I'm going to sit with this line. But my body's capacity to sit with this line is studying which means then that's also my body's capacity to sit in company with you, Trisha, as we're trying to figure out something institutional, which means my body's capacity to sit in a larger group as we're trying to act. And, and so maybe I scale things, mm -hmm. that's, that's the process of scale. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear the question, that's the first thing that, that comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's such an important, I think, emphasis that <clears throat> we realize even in the moments of, of what we think uh, gives us room and distance from that which causes harm, we are in fact sort mm. of rushing into the space mm. of harm, right? Mm. Um, uh, and, and what you're really, what you're doing is um, um, you're just, you're really asking us to really think about that space as not the only space, right, for us to, to, to occupy and how important it is um, to carve and to, to hold and to make room for. Um, I don't think it feels frivolous at all, but I can, but I'm sure many people would make a claim like that, right, to say we have to fix the world, which, you know, I'm on the, I'm on the side of fixing the world, but you know, the first rule is, you know, you have to try not to go crazy yourself. And, right. and part of that is, is taking this kind of work so seriously. Mm -hmm. um, could, could, I just, could I just add, this is part of, mm -hmm. Trisha, you hit on something, and maybe it's an echo of being in conversation with you in another space. Um, part of it too is about like disciplinarity differences, right? That the, that, that the, the urgency of the terror of the world right now feels so total and overwhelming that it, it maybe um, uh, interrupts our capacity to think about like the richness of what different disciplinary practices offers. Mm -hmm. and, and here I'm relying on disciplinarity as a inflection of the academy, even as for me, studying is not the province of the academy. We know that, right? What a, what a person does when they're making bread or what a person does when they're gardening or walking down the street is indeed to pay attention and to try to pursue the line of that attention. Mm. So there is, there is that. And there's also, uh, I always forget to say that one of the reasons I love Lucille Clifton's reply is that before Clifton became in the last 10 years, a kind of revered figure, and even still that her poetics get misread as if they are straightforward and clear, right? And so that poem, you see that poem, that poem looks really straightforward. Yeah. And to <laughs> use the word simple, a word that I love mm -hmm. as a person who is himself quite simple, like I have one question that I've been pursuing for 25 years, right? Um, and yet, if you stay with the poem, mm -hmm. if you have faith that Lucille Clifton this black woman who lived in space and time in the United States, if you have faith that she whittled away at that poem, that she didn't just, mm. whether, whether it came in one moment, that it lived in her, right? If you have faith in that, which allows you to then have faith in your capacity to stay with the thing and suspend there, ooh, 
Right. You know, like, and I think right. that's relevant too, not just yeah. to how we live our lives, but then what do yeah. we do politically? Right. Um, and how do we do, how do we just do justice even better? So yeah. Um, yeah. I'll yeah. stop. No, no, that's so wonderful because, you know, the, the, it was a reply, but it wasn't a reply just to that question. It was a reply to the, to the question of the organization of the world yeah. that Clifton yeah. was negotiating and managing. So it comes out as one reply in one moment, but it, it's, it's, it's really a much bigger reply. Mm. Um, that's always going on. So it's, mm. it's, and that's what your work is asking us to do really, to pay attention to that. You use the making bread, which is a great metaphor because of course it takes time, right? Mm. For, mm. for it to rise, for it to, you know, a lot has to happen. Mm. Um, and so there's something about honoring that space of, of um, working out the answers as it mm. were, mm. not waiting for the question. Um, mm. Right, because it's all it's already there, right? Mm -hmm. um, although that wasn't amazingly horrible. I, you know, it's hard to believe Du Bois would get a piece of mail like this, but it's important to remember uh, where where from whence we come. Mm -hmm. um, all right, we got a whole bunch of people who I'm going to make sure we get to, um, so that I don't take advantage of this great space I have with you um, individually and make it my own private discussion. Um, all right, we have Nasir Marumo. And his question is the following. Uh, I have a question about openness and relation to, and, and openness and relation and listening. How do other voices contribute to how we might make a new one, hmm. an otherwise one out of a black self? Hmm. How does listening to the quality of the voice slash sound of another help us to imagine ourselves as a one in a new way. Mm. I'm going to mm. stop there. There's like four other questions because mm. that's how Nasir rolls, but I'm going <laughs> to yeah. a lot of richness, but I, I want to give you a chance. Do you want me to repeat any of that? No, no I think I, I, I think, um, thank you Nasir for, um, you know, for all these years of, of thinking together um, I'll say part of, um, Nasir, I hear in your question, a specific inflection of, um, of like sonic practices, right? Of, of thinking about listening and, and the quality of voice. And so maybe my response won't fully get to that piece of it, though I think what I'm about to say is relevant. Part of thinking about relation in my reading through Blasant and Buber is to remember that relation is the invitation for the one to be able to bear being open in the world, right? And, and Buber iconically says in I and Thou from 1923 says, it's impossible to live that way. It's impossible to do this mm. and to stay that way all the time for any number of reasons. Our, our sensory capacities as human beings will not allow that. But if indeed one is not trying to get to that, which is to be able to, to bear and meet and take in, take in as a kind of totality. Like when Lord says, I am who the world and I have never seen before. It's also this moment of incredible risk because it means being taken over. This is where the idea of the individual is so useless. I mean, aside from all of its, its um, entanglements with, with histories and, and political idioms that we know to be troubled. And we know in fact, not to be imagined as if they belong to people who are gender female and or black, et cetera, um, is that there is no against in the world of relation, there just is. And so I think part of what Nasir, what I hear in your question is like using the sonic, like the totality of how sound enters an atmosphere and therefore takes over or becomes promiscuous with, um, mm -hmm. with, with all sound, sound becomes promiscuous with sound, that there's an interesting metaphor there. One, I want to be careful because there's also, you know, there's the distinctness of one person listening and hearing differentiated from another person listening and hearing. And so I don't want to, to, overdo the totality so that I ignore differentiation. 
But the, the problem is to bear differentiation. And this is where for me, um, a work like Toni Morrison's Sula, I'm fond of saying that like, you know, I'm gonna keep going to Sula until I have my last day because I find so much there. And I think people read that character as if she is unethical or self-centered, but Sula is trying to do something that in some ways is hard for us to imagine a black female subject doing. Sula is trying to be like this in the world. And, 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 and she assumes that the world will bear her wild openness. And she also assumes that every other human being in the world is trying to do that, which might be the mistake, right? Because so many mm. of the human beings in that novel are closed by, encased by what they perceive to be the, lim the accepted limits of their identities. So I've jumped around in that question, but I think um, there's, I think Nasir, there's a rich possibility for thinking about sonic practices as um, maybe exceptionally relational. And then what's the trouble of that, of that relationality vis-a-vis -vis how one might hear differently or might be inflected by um, the hearing of or from another. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Uh, and the next question is from uh, Candace uh, Buchanan. Um, and this question is, uh, uh, begins with the following. Thank you for this amazing talk. I've been lost in your words. I'd be interested to know what practical steps Black readers could take to divorce themselves from the mm. horrifying world in which mm. we live in order to submerge ourselves in the aliveness you describe. Mm. Maybe it's because I'm tired, but- uh, I'm happy that, to repeat. No, no, no. Oh. That I, no, I'm just saying that that question almost brings me to tears. And I'm like, yeah. I'm trying to hold on to 530 um, know, and, and, right, and not decline. Um, well, we got uh, you either way. Candice, um, when, when, I, uh, when I was at Smith College for a long time and things would explode, I'd say so often do, especially in the, in the midst of Black Lives Matter, um, Smith was a smaller community and um, I used to try to figure out how to hold as many students, especially Black students, but any students who were in the company of study and wanted to be held as possible. And I would just try to say to them, what if you imagine that going over to the library in the midst of this institutional terror, what if you say, today the thing I need is I'm gonna go sit and figure out how to make that sentence in that essay I'm writing good. What would it mean for you to take that seriously? And, 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 and to not feel heretical in doing that as peers of yours are saying, oh, we have this dying, can you come help us organize, right? What, what if you can, what would it mean for you to sit with what feels heretical about that? Mm. And then um, the poet Nikki Finney, when she won the National Book Award in 2012 or 2012, um, meant some of you may know this. Um, her National Book Award speech was a poem. And at the end of it, she says something like this. She, um, she's citing different people who moved her. And she said, um, Dr. Gloria, Gloria Wade Gale's best teacher, you saw me sitting on a wall on a, of Talladega College, 1977, um, dreaming of the only life I ever wanted, which was the life of a poet. You said to me, Miss Finney, do you really have time to be sitting there? Have you read every book in the library? Now, I wanna be careful in, in the, the library is not the only space where studying happens. And Finney, as well as Dr. Gloria Wade Gales, are both like ferociously community activists and so on. But there was something about like that teacher saying, you say you want to be a poet. How do you take yourself seriously mm -hmm. and um, conceptualize yourself with the right to read? every book in the library, impossible task though it may be. And I think there is something about, about that. Um, it's, 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 the, it's the line of, 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 of the sentence you're trying to write and thinking, 
what if this urgency is as big as the urgency as the next thing I'm going to do in mobilizing with my friends? And I, I always feel like I have to do some encasement around saying things like that. But I think, especially for people who are Black, we get called into the world only to help to try to save the world from itself even a saving that might not necessarily save us if the world gets saved. And, and I don't, and I think that work is important too. I find myself as a person contributing both time and financially and otherwise to that work. And what else? Last thing I will say, um, you know, Toni Morrison, Toni Morrison was a human being who often had a pencil behind her ear. And, you know, that vision of Toni Morrison with that pencil, as if she were a carpenter or a writer or a person doing mathematics, right? That there's something about like a, a metaphorization of right. a kind of work. And we know the impact that Morrison's work and thinking, not just her work, her thinking has had to the political and social world we live in. And so I would, want, I would want any person who's black to feel as if they too could have that, that right to go seek and find, to practice um, yeah, mm -hmm. the willfulness of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed, yes, indeed. This question really follows, I think, quite well um, from where you've led us, Kevin. Um, this is Danielle Charle Charlemagne, and uh, they say, as a social studies teacher, educator, Afro-Caribbean, and having been enlivened by your book and the worthy work of reading, Holy Encounter, Solitude, I'm thinking of aliveness as pedagogy. Hmm. What caution would you offer as I go about that work? Hmm. Oh, Lord, I don't... Uh, Danielle, I don't know that I have, um, I don't know that I have a caution because I don't think I have yet myself conceptualized it as pedagogy. And so I love that invitation. Um, uh, whew, yeah. That's a tough um, one. Yeah. But that, that, so that, that is, I, um, uh, maybe one thing I will say as I'm, as I'm, that's a very generous conceptualization. The thing I will say when I, um, as a black person who is also of Caribbean descent, when I walk into the classroom, my job is to try to make a space that we can all study together, which means that I have to in encourage care and rigor. And those two things are not opposed to each other. Indeed, there's a rigor of care as well as there's a kind of care and rigor, like I wanna take the material seriously. My job is also to be able to say, I want to behold everyone in this space. And to do that, I know I'm working against a mountain of logics that would to tell me, even as someone who's black, um, that there's certain privileging of certain people in the space I'm supposed to do. And I don't wanna do the counter privileging where I'm then say, I only wanna behold the black people in the room, but I need to at least be clear about the complicated logics of if we were, are going to be here together mm -hmm. in the risk of reading together, which means misreading to go back to Nasir's question, if we are going to be corrupted by each other's work of listening and speaking, because we are not all listening and speaking on the same register, same rhythm, but we have for this hour and a half to be here together, then it means I have to be somewhat transparent about the difficulty of that work and the things that I think I'm, I'm um, highlighting as a way to maybe try to make that work more possible. And so there's, there's a lot of reminding us of, of the, the messiness of it, but to not presume that that messiness should should repeat burdensomeness to certain marked groups in the room and, and to just reinforce that as much as possible. That re reading together is as hard as being together for any of us here who are coupled with people. Um, and so we should, we should, if aliveness can be a pedagogy, ooh, Danielle, thank you for that kindness. If it can be a pedagogy of reading, then it also means we've gotta be 
that there's a pedagogy of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that responsibility has to be articulated um, uh, broadly and repeatedly and um, fluently, dynamically as things, as things go. Um, Danielle, I don't know uh, who you are, but if you want to reach out to me, I, I want to think more about this and might have more that I could say that would be um, a little bit more um, uh, coherent than in some ways what I might have just said. Wow, that's, that's, that's a really interesting opening. Um, okay, we have, these are, these are very intense questions you have engendered today. Uh, this one is um, an anonymous uh, questioner, participant. Professor Kwashi, as always, your thinking is nuanced, careful, and beautiful. Going off of your mention of Glissant, as well as your mention of Toni Morrison's commentary on Beloved, I wanted to ask you how you think of uncertainty as a method of imagining black worlds, mm. right? Uncertainty as a method of imagining black worlds. Mm. That is to say, how does one sit with the mysteries and opacities that black aliveness produces? And what do those mysteries do? Mm. Here, I'm also thinking of the ending of Morrison's paradise. Mm. Oh, I don't know who this person is, but this person knows how to, Go straight to my heart. Paradise is, is one of the books I love. Um, I love the, the use of the word mystery because, um, uh, you know, I think of the line from the Reader Dove poem, if you can't be free, be a mystery, which, which Farrah Griffin then takes up for a biography of, um, of Billie Holiday. Um, and Blackness or Black femaleness as what would it what it, would it mean for blackness to be a mystery not only in the world to be able to be a mystery but to be a mystery to us mm -hmm. black people right so so often when we are feeling possessive about blackness the idea the identity the cultural possessions cultural products we want to then delineate what blackness is or is not and i understand those gestures um, uh, for they are gestures that are made in the kind of wake of um, the violence of appropriation or other kinds of harms that can happen. Um, but it is indeed a call to, to allow oneself to be a mystery. Um, I will say um, the other thing that came to mind as I heard this question, well, two things. One, um, the writer Fanny Howe has a brief essay called Bewilderment. Um, that I just love. And I think the idea of bewilderment, which is like to be made wild, it's, um, it's a prose essay. Um, uh, it's just, it's a prose essay. Yeah, that's uh, redundant. But it's, uh, it's uh, that came to mind as I was thinking about this question. The other thing that came to mind is the discourse of representation and the limits of the discourse of representation. So we know, I don't mean representation in a political or a civic sense. Um, I mean, in a kind of in cultural art. And um, when I was uh, working with the press to think about the cover of the book, the cover is this piece by uh, Shanique Smith that, um, that I love. Um, there was another piece, the um, uh, Jacob Lawrence, piece that's cited and it's in the book and it's actually over my shoulder, a bad reprint is over my shoulder that I also had thought about for the cover of the book, but too, too long and too boring a story to tell. I didn't want, the, the press had done these beautiful cover mock-ups with incredible art by contemporary black artists and that had uh, figures or images of black people in them. And you know, I have so much fondness for Whitlove, Whitfield Lavelle's work and Lorna Simpson's work. And so there is just so much contemporary black art happening. And I did not want a, a representational figure on the cover because I didn't want it to somehow unconsciously communicate the idea that this is what black aliveness looks like. Mm -hmm. Because I think as powerful as our representations of the multiplicity of what blackness is and can be, that we are often falling prey to certain terms of normalcy. I was giving a talk in an Africana studies class the last week, uh, uh, Professor Ainsley Lashur, whom I adore, and um, a student was talking afterwards about 
issues of representation. And it, it came to me that I love Black Panther. Where are the fat Black people in Black Panther? Right? And, and, and I don't say this like to be comical or anything. I say this because there's something about what I imagine you know, of the future might look like that I think I just always want to be careful. And that's, that's me, not careful. That, that makes it sound modest. I want to find other ways to feel fully or more fully invited into mm. um, the breath of my breathing in and then beyond representational logics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I think somehow I, I, when that question was asked, I thought about that in terms of thinking about mystery and mm -hmm. the capacity for mystery. Right, right, right. Wow. Okay. I think we might have time for one or two more, and there are a few more after that, but I'm going to take uh, the two that I think um, give you some new places to go. Um, this is interesting. Um, Ayoka Stewart, uh, as you introduced this notion of Black aliveness, I immediately thought of jazz by Toni Morrison. Mm. Specifically, that beautiful, this thing jumps as soon as I, okay. Specifically, that beautiful moment at the end where the narrator unravels, mm. startled, reveling in, and even laid bare by the revelation that people, and Black people specifically, are expansive, even though after an experience of loss, even after an experience of loss or rage. Your comments about a Black aesthetic call to mind this question of how Black women construct Black aliveness. Mm. And it made me wonder if Black men do this too. Mm. Or is it, uh, or is this the way we can understand what is unique or special about the way that Black women write? Is this also Black women's contribution to the larger discourse of racial justice or reckoning? Hmm. Um, Ayoka Stewart, so good to, to, to hear your name called. It's been many years um, uh, since. Thank you for that question. I, the, the first part I might say, in addition to the fact that you call up the end of jazz, which, you know, um, if you all don't know Toni Morrison's jazz, it is, a, it is a difficult book to read, but the ending, like the last six pages, it, it will break you in, in, in a way that, um, that is worth it. Um, oh, I envy then the Republic love. I alone have longed for it. I, I have that section memorized of the, the last three pages I used wow. to memorize because it's so good. I love meditation. So to get to the question, um, in going to thinking with black women's writing, especially, but not only. I, I, I would say that I don't know that I want to make a claim that only Black women are doing this, especially because I feel called into it and I'm not gendered female. But I do think there are ways that Black women's exclusion from certain categories, right? All the women are white, all the Blacks are men, but some of us are brave. Even that, I, I use that title as a way that the, the normative calculus for recognizing difference along uh, the register that modernity offers us says there's the human, and then there are these two categories of, of subhumaning right, which is gendering and, and racialization. There are certainly are others, but, um, and so all the women are white and all the blacks are men. And this category of brave is a thing that exists, like it's not a political or social term, right? And so there's something about, I think, running up against the, the limits of those normative calculus, uh, calculuses, calculus, that, has inspired some Black women writers to try to think beyond that. And so in, in the work, I talk a little bit about exception and exemption that produces um, the case of oneness. And oneness is the philosophical position, right? The, the sense of like, I, uh, I alone know what it is to be alive on this day. I'm going to write from that position. And of course, there's a certain amount of arrogance in that. But because oneness is relational, the arrogance isn't to say that everyone has to feel this, this, 
this way, it becomes, I'm, as I read it in the work, it becomes a posture to open up towards more. So I would, I don't wanna reify that distinction, but I do think in studying, if you study black women's stuff, cultural production and their thought, um, you find these examples of them trying to push against that normativity, partly because I don't think that they could easily fall back on, mm. right? Blackness, well, blackness didn't belong to black women conceptually as easily as perhaps blackness might belong to black men. And again, we have to then think about the normativity of that gender binary and what that means and so on. But I think that's what I'm recognizing as a, as, as a possibility in exemption that produces a kind of exception, exception in, uh, in some Black women's work. And I'd want to say some, because I also don't want to presume, right, that everybody Black and female is, is doing this thing, because that seems mm -hmm. to me um, like a closing of the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right, one last question. We only have three minutes. It's amazing. There are still like 85 people here, which, you know, it's dinner time. And so this is just a testament to how much mm -hmm. energy and joy and mm -hmm. beauty and and challenge and grace that you, you offer us. Um, thank you for this beautiful presentation. This is an anonymous attendee. Your remarks make me think of about the weirdness of one as a pronoun. Of all the pronouns, it's the most abstract and universal. One signifies I and also we. It refers simultaneously to any single person and every single body. This makes me think about how in Black studies, we often talk about the moral obligation of the individual to the well-being of the racial collective. Could you say more about the relationship of oneness, not only to individuality, but also to collectivity and community? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I love the, whomever asked that question, I love the glossing of one. And indeed, it's the fact that, that one has that capacity to do that arrogant gesture of totality that I love because the one saying one is after all only a one, mm -hmm. right? You imagine a kind of iconic philosopher writing a line that has the pronoun one in it. And the one who is thinking and saying that is only a one. And so I love the tension that is there in the singularity of the person saying one that opens out into trying to project themselves into the instance of being more than they are. This is, I think, uh, in the work, I try to think about subject object dynamics in some of the poem. And I love too that the person who asked the question asked about collectivity. I, um, near the conclusion of the work, I talk about finding collectivity much more important for thinking about relationality than community because too often community wants to draw a circle around and any attempt to try to draw a circle around that says, okay, this is the black community, um, I think inevitably leaves some person in a corner, right? So now I'm literalizing, but the literal metaphor opens up to the ideological. Mm -hmm. And so I'm interested in the, what it means to try to be a collective of being together. We're being together doesn't have a limit. There is just more being together. So if it's two people being together, if it's 10 people being together, if it's 25, it's, it's 40, so that there is just more being together and the, the possibility and risk that opens out into that. I have to say, before we, we're now out of time, Trisha, you just used the word testament to say that you know people sticking around is, is somehow a testament to me. Um, uh, the, the real testament is that um, I, I so appreciate people staying with me and not just as a person, but in the way that I'm trying to study. Um, mm -hmm. All I'm trying to do is to follow a line of thought. And I often feel, you know, uneasy in, in doing it in, in these spaces, but I've also been really fortunate to have um, to have people show up and meet me and be with me and be with the ideas. I'm so grateful as I am grateful to you and everyone in CSREA. So thank you, thank you mightily. And yeah, I hope people stay well and safe. Yes, indeed. Well, you are a blessing to us. We so appreciate you and, 
and uh, we're, you know, you always have a home here and, and uh, um, we're so delighted that this was an amazing group of people. It really is, you've assembled some incredible minds here. I wish we could gather them all together in, as you just put it, a collective of being together again soon, because this was a, a really wonderful, wonderful conversation. And for those of you who don't have Professor Kwashi's book, we have a link in the chat for um, where to get it on Brown Bookstore and elsewhere. It's, it's absolutely amazing if you were here and not yet sure where to find it. If we were in person and we hadn't had to grapple with this pandemic, we would have the book for sale. We would have some wine and cheese. So hold on, eventually we will return in some form or fashion in person and, uh, and move forward together. So thank you, Professor Kwashi. We'll see you again soon. And thank you everyone, especially all the staff and media services and CSREA staff who are amazing, uh, who brought this to being and made it possible. All right, everyone, have a wonderful night. Thank you.